Bowser's an anti-feminist. <laughs> Welcome to Wow of True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop, here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm your Discord lurker, Isabel. And I'm your millennial who does yoga, Amanda. <laughs> Anyone can be famous on the internet, so why not oh, us? Oh, I'm also your millennial who does yoga. Yeah. <laughs> I gave myself a little line there because I just think it's extremely funny that we were going to record at 10 a.m. this morning. It is now 1230. But then we were like, what if we push it back so we can both go to yoga? Yeah, it was like Amanda like messaged me being like, are we on for 10? And then I was like, yeah, unless you want to change it. And she was like, I want to go to yoga. And I was like, excellent. Now I can also go to yoga. <laughs> Because I had also been thinking about that, but I didn't want to change the time because, you know, changing times is a whole situation. Well, I feel like we had different yoga experiences because you said you went to hot yoga. I think hot yoga is a scam, but that's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. The thing is like hot yoga, I feel like I stretch more. If, do you know what I mean? Where it's like, I don't know if it's doing anything more for me, but it definitely feels like I've done more things. I don't, I just, I don't want to be sweaty. Like, I mean, sweating is generally part of exercise, but I want to be like a normal amount of sweaty. Like I very much enjoyed doing my yoga yoga in a room temperature room. I love that for you. Also, like, the thing is that the, the regular yoga would have been at 9 a.m. versus 10.30, and oh, I was no. like, yeah. yeah, your boy's just gonna be hot. It's gonna be 10.30, and yeah. we're gonna get sweaty. It's fine. Damn, Please don't valid. leave that the pull quote, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> was it, like, is hot yoga inherently intense? It's like, I mean, not really. It depends on what sequence that the person wants, who's instructing wants to do. This is, this is not good content. <laughs> This is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's inherently funny that we are talking about yoga. So we both did yoga this morning because we're millennial girl bosses. TBT to went on the podcast. We were like, are we Gen Z? I think the fact that we do yoga means that we're millennial. Yeah, Gen Z doesn't do yoga. It's but now fine. we're going to talk about video games, like children. Yeah, and who is more relatable <laughs> to the people? than Mario. <laughs> is Mario relatable to anybody? <laughs> Mario is relatable specifically to Italian plumbers who go, Yahoo! Wait, that was a really good Yahoo! Holy shit. Yahoo! I do work for Yahoo, so. I think that if Mario were to be made today, he would be cancelled. That's my hot Mario yeah. take. Can I try to do my Yoshi? Yes, impression? please do. Yoshi! That was really good. I should be a voice you actor. Should. What am I doing in podcasting? I mean, I guess, um, <laughs> hey, if anyone's listening who needs someone to make Mario noises, Amanda is right here for you. Okay, why are we talking about Mario, Amanda? Yoshi! <laughs> So there's a Mario movie coming out next year. And the Mario movie, let me just first read you a quote from the Washington Post. Films have often been rupture points for mimetic breakthroughs on the internet. They're like volcanoes that erupt, shifting the meme landscape to its chaotic whims. The 21st century has already seen several such eruptions. Shrek, B-movie. <laughs> and now, very likely, the Mario movie starring Chris Pratt. <sighs> So last year, Nintendo announced that they were working on an animated Mario movie with a studio called Illumination. Isabel, do you know what Illumination is most well known for? Oh god, I feel like I'm being put on the spot here because I've heard the name. I don't. Is it fucking Minions? Is it fucking... Yes, Fuck. it's Minions. <laughs> okay. Even when the film was first announced, they started announcing some of the cast, which is just absolutely ridiculous. We have Chris Pratt as Mario, as previously discussed. Anya Taylor-Joy as Princess Peach. Charlie Day as Luigi. Jack Black as Bowser. Keegan-Michael Key as Toad. Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong. And Fred Armisen as Cranky Kong. Personally, as a Jew... I think that Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong is the representation that we want to see, you know? <laughs> I support this and I support you. I'm personally excited for Charlie Day's Luigi. I, I just want to see what he's bringing to the table with that. Yeah, I mean, I will say in the trailer, Jack Black actually like killed him. Yeah, well, I mean, I was completely unsurprised that Jack Black would like... Jack Black was made for this role in a lot of ways, I think. I just feel like that's a yeah. dude who can ham it up. And like, yeah, it's it's funny because like, I feel like this is one of those animated movies where they're like, let's get an all-star cast. And also Chris Pratt is here and he's not doing a good voice. Can we talk about that? Yeah, so the Mario trailer dropped about two weeks ago. And as we said, Jack Black really put his entire redacted into it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And also what was funny was an hour before the trailer dropped, which was like an anticipated moment that people were like waiting for, Joe Biden announced that he was going to pardon all federal offenses of simple marijuana possession. So then people were like, damn, the Mario movie is uh, really doing it. Maybe this is like, you haven't heard the notes about our supernatural Trump situation. Maybe the Mario movie, like Mario to positive political change situation. What do you feel about that? Maybe when the Mario movie comes out, Joe Biden will, I don't know if he can do this, but he will find a way for people that have state marijuana offenses to be pardoned. I don't think he can do that, but it's been a while since I've taken like the federal. Yeah, I don't think he can do that, which I mean, speaking of like the politics, I mean, it's like, it's a very cool idea because it's very stupid if people are in jail for like smoking, smoking weed. One like weed. that's ridiculous. No one should be in jail for weed, but because it only applies to federal offenses, most of the offenses are not at the federal level. So who's to say, but maybe with the next Mario trailer, who knows what'll exactly. happen. And also, I mean, I think it's like, unironically, like, you know, federal like big federal changes like that signal to the states this is the direction that we're moving in which is like mostly good do you think there's like a volume of weed at which it it should be a crime like i'm thinking if like if you have like a literal metric ton of weed that feels like something different than one weed but also i think it's kind of fine but also i feel like if you have a ton like a metric ton of weed that's actually not even like a weed problem that's a like what are you doing what's in your driveway yeah why are you like this it's spilling out into the road i just think that the carceral system shouldn't apply to drugs so unless i guess i mean on, we're, now we're getting into the politics but i'm like maybe if you're like somebody who is actively lacing things with fentanyl and you're like a serial killer but the way you serial kill people is by lacing things well with then fentanyl. that's not even a fentanyl then, thing that's just kind of like a buddy you're killing people that's premeditated yeah. murder yeah but you know in most cases maybe our justice system is broken i think everyone should be they should legally have to do at least one weed <laughs> You should go to jail if you don't. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. You have to do at least one weed. Um, (laughs) No. Well, so speaking of the justice system, Mario. (laughs) I mean, Mario is an arbiter of justice. He is fighting to save Princess Peach or something. I mean, no, he is explicitly trying to rescue Princess Peach from Bowser. Like, I'm pretty sure that's the whole situation here. You were correct. Yeah, Bowser's an (laughs) (laughs) anti-feminist. Okay, we've gotten mad off topic. What were you going to say? Yeah, so Joe Biden pardoning small marijuana federal offenses. Mario trailer drops right after. This was also the day when Elon Musk was doing a bunch of shit, which is like any day, you know. But Chris Pratt had previously said like, oh, like this Mario voice I'm going to do, you've never seen it before. And his voice is just Chris Pratt. It's just regular. It's just the boy. And like people are mad about this because like Mario is such an iconic character with his voice. Like Charles Martinet's like Mario voice. That's Mario. That's your boy. Chris is like, hello, I'm Chris. He's like, hello, it is me, Andy Dwyer from Parks and Rec. I am Mario. (laughs) Yeah, and then even like before the trailer, they played little clips of Chris Pratt and Jack Black talking about like what the movie means to them. And then Chris Pratt was like completely straight faced. He was like, ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be Mario. And it's like, no, Chris, it's clear that you don't give a shit. And like, I think Chris did not know what he was walking into in voicing Mario. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, I don't think he understood like the enormity of how Mario features in people's like headspaces and how much clowning on people would do to him. Yeah, so to quote that Washington Post article again, Enter Mario, voiced by Chris Pratt, with all the passion of a Chris Pratt character, sounding exactly like Chris Pratt and not at all like the chirpy (laughs) voice of the games where he is voiced by Charles Martinet. So this brings us to the crux of the episode, the Mario Thought Experiment. The Mario Thought Experiment is brought to you by a tweet, like many things, which is hiring Charles Martinet, parentheses, Mario 64 actor, on Cameo to recite all of Chris Pratt's lines from the Mario movie and personally hand-dubbing each one to release my own bootleg on BitTorrent. So the question is, could you do this? Like, okay, like, technically you can do anything. But, okay, so we talked about this beforehand, and Amanda was like, I want, like, a legal breakdown of, is this cool? Is this okay to do? Is this fair use and parody? And Amanda made me, um, I can't believe she made me look up the law. It's been 84 million years. I dug out my notes from law school, so if anything major has changed in copyright law in the last two years, too fucking bad, I don't have a Lexus subscription anymore. (laughs) 
I'm so excited to learn, but I do have some sad news first. Okay. Charles Martinet is not on Cameo. That's devastating. Yo, what the fuck? Yeah. So our whole episode is just ruined. Well, no, okay, here's the other thing you could do. And this is what this is the other thing I've heard people talking about. Where you just take out all of Chris Pratt's dialogue and replace it with little bits of Mario dialogue <laughs> from various, like, you know, games. Yeah. You just have, like, you know, his, like, Yeah, his... like an, an engineered deep fake. Yeah, or just, like, have him say, like, wahoo! You know, when he's supposed to be <laughs> saying, like, things. I think the movie would still scan. Oh, yeah, all, all of Mario's lines are just, yahoo! Like, honestly, I think that would be an enjoyable experience. I think that'd be extremely funny. Someone has already made, like, a little trailer cut of it. <laughs> That's so good. But okay, fine. Let's do some law about Mario. Let's do some Mario law. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you went to law school for, the Mario This is what law. I went to law school for. Okay, so I'm actually not an IP lawyer, so don't don't at me. This is not legal advice. Anything that I say is yeah, legal advice. anything Amanda advice. says is legal advice. Anything I say is actually illegal advice, including my comments about weed earlier. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so the first thing that we need to talk about is not even about the law. It is about the fact that Nintendo is so goddamn litigious. Like, Nintendo yes. is known for being litigious and for being, like, very aggro about their IP in a way that a lot of other companies are not as aggro about their IP. Another company that's actually very aggro about their IP that I've probably talked about here is, like, Louis Vuitton, which is also very aggro. And these people know that these things are aggro because you see more court cases. And also that they'll just, like, send more people NDAs and, like, you know, like, Nintendo gets mad about people, like, making, like, Pokemon riffs and shit like that and, like, not putting their games anyway. I will say that at an indeterminate point in time, I did attend a Nintendo press event. And I will say at the Nintendo press events, they send you an NDA beforehand that you have to sign. And then once you get there, they read you the NDA. Yeah, like I said, they're aggro. I've never had that happen to me but, before. Like I said, they're aggro. It was kind of girl boss though. Good for uh, them. Honestly, I think they're a little bit too aggro, but I'm also like, the point I'm trying to make here is that Nintendo will sue you. <laughs> Yes. And then when Nintendo sues you, Isabel will represent you as your Mario lawyer. I will lawyer. not be your goddamn Mario lawyer. <laughs> I didn't go to law school for this. So <laughs> the point being, it's not even a question of will you get sued? You will get sued. The question is, will you win in court? So this is a fair use question on multiple fronts because of the fact that you're taking two pieces of IP that are both basically taken from somebody else. In a situation where you're taking the Mario movie and putting other stuff in it, the Mario movie is like, you know, you free real estate in it, right? Like that is somebody else's IP that you're fucking with. And depending on what you put in for Chris Pratt's voice, whether it's like Mario noises or if it's like Charles Martinet speaking, if you hire Charles Martinet to speak, he probably can't sue you for this because he knows that you're doing this however if you didn't tell him that you were going to use him for this that actually might be like not cool and good and he might sue you but honestly he seems like a nice guy and i think he thinks this is funny <laughs> um however if he also has some sort of contract with nintendo under what circumstances he can do the mario voice he probably yeah does. so then there might be other problems here but we'd have to actually look at those contracts because ip and like ip ownership especially copyright stuff is very much all like user generated lawsuits it's not like there's like a guy who's gonna come and like attack you about it it's, it's all about like the individual people yeah you know you ugl user generated yeah, exactly lawsuits. and then in the scenario that you're taking content from the existing Mario games, then Nintendo can basically sue you on two fronts. And also, like, it probably isn't Nintendo suing you for the movie. It's whatever studio is releasing. It's Illumination. It's Illumination suing you. It's the Minions! Imagine getting in a lawsuit and the other side suing you is, like, Minions, and there's, like, a little Minion in a suit, and he's the lawyer, and he's talking in Minionese to the judge. Anyway... <laughs> Oh no, I was gonna say, like, the lawyer shows up to the court case and he's writing on a legal pad that has, like, minions art on it. I think I would it. just leave. I think I would just be like, yeah, man, you win. I gotta get out of here. What have I done with my life? It's like, like, Legally Blonde, where it's, like, Elle Woods with all the pink stuff being like, I'm a lawyer and I like pink, except it's somebody who's, like, only writing his legal briefs and minions. Should I be Elle Woods for Halloween? I think you I think should. That'd be funny, right? Because I'm, like, a lawyer. And I could do the voice. I yeah. can do the voice pretty good. Do it. What? Like it's hard? I've considered being Elizabeth Holmes for Halloween just because it's such a low effort costume. You just wear a black turtleneck and put on red lipstick and make your hair kind of frazzled and drink green juice. I can do that. I think you could do that on like a regular day. Yeah, I mean, I do wear a lot of black turtlenecks because I used to work at an art museum. So, you know, and everybody that works in the arts wears black turtlenecks. I feel like the problem with the Elizabeth Holmes cosplay is that it might not land for most people. Yeah. Can I try to do my Elizabeth Please Holmes do. voice? Um, okay, I'm going to read one of these Washington Post quotes that I have in the Elizabeth Holmes voice. Enter Mario. 
voiced by Chris <laughs> Pratt with all the passion of a Chris Pratt character, <laughs> sounding exactly like Chris Pratt, right? And with just one drop of blood, <laughs> we could change the world. With one drop of blood, Mario t- can enter your universe. Anyway, speaking of girl bosses, Isabel explaining the law to us. Isabel noted Mario lawyer. Okay, so basically... You pop into the courtroom out of a pipe. <laughs> Okay, so... And you go, Yahoo! Oh my god. I would also just leave. I'd be like, what have I done with my life? Um, Okay, so basically, (laughs) this is a fair use question. And in either scenario, all of the parts are being copped from, like, different sources. There's nothing here that you've made originally. The only original stuff you're doing is the combination. And so... Basically, the only defense you have here is that this is fair use. And this would come, fair use is one of those defenses that you bring up in court. It's not something you can bring up beforehand, but it's also like one of those things where if people kind of think it's fair use beforehand, they might not actually sue you. Nintendo will sue you. So, I cannot stress enough, we are just doing regular legal analysis here. This isn't funny or anything. It's just legal analysis about Mario. Well, it's funny because it's about Mario. It is about Mario. Okay, so the four fair use factors are the purpose and character of the use. So, like, whether it's being used for a commercial thing or if it's, like, for an educational purpose or something, journalism, something like that. Basically, if you're using it for something that's not, like, I'm selling it, it's a little bit more likely that it's, like, okay to use. Two, the nature of the copyrighted work. What is it? What are you doing with it? What's the thing that you... The vibes. And like, honestly, the four fair use factors are very much just like all vibes in like a different way. But like the interesting thing about copyright law is that it's very much like you're just trying to codify vibes into law. Incredible. And you said this wasn't fun. (laughs) And then third is the amount and like substantiality of the portion used in relation to like the copyrighted work as a whole. So like, it's like, look, if you took like two seconds from something... It's a different story than if you took the whole thing. In this case, we have taken the entire Mario movie. Except for Chris Pratt's voice. Except for Chris Pratt's voice. And the effect of the use upon the potential market, like, or, like, the value of the copyrighted work. Basically, by, like, taking this, have you made the first thing inherently less valuable because what we care about if you're bringing a lawsuit is like have i been harmed and the harm is monetary in this scenario right because it's like what you're saying when you bring this lawsuit is like i've been harmed here's how to fix it money is going to fix it essentially and then parody falls under transformative use now we need to talk about transformative use like very briefly just because that's a sub factor that will change the way that you analyze the first four factors does that make sense yes and that's why there's the ao3 the the nonprofit is the office of trans Transformative right, because if you're saying something that's transformative, basically transformative means that this is so trans, like this is so different, this is so changed from the original that it's like not really a derivative work anymore. Like, okay, you've made something new, and if something is categorized as transformative, then basically the more transformative it is, the less you look at the market harm. And parody is generally considered like usually transformative. Because it's like, okay, this is like, yeah, you're fucking with it. I'm just describing all this in super vague terms because first of all, we don't have like a month to talk about it. And second of all, because it's like (laughs) a lot of the stuff is basically just the judge will go through these factors and talk about how this is similar to a different case. This is similar to previous judicial rulings on this. That Like, how much does it, like, fit into this scenario? Yeah, that, that really is all that legal documents are. I've been reading a lot of legal mm-hmm. documents recently because I have been writing about Elon Musk and thus having to read a lot of legal documents. And yeah, law is literally just being like, well, that guy did it before, so I no, can't. Yeah, so that's the thing about the American legal system is that what a lot of it does, it is iterative on itself. Like memes. No, literally like memes because it's like, you always want to go to the highest authority that has come before you or the most recent one, depending on like what's the scenario. You're trying to persuade a judge that this is how we do this. This is how it has always been done, um, essentially. I'm also not a litigation person, so this is actually maybe not completely accurate. Again, illegal advice. So maybe like to talk about some examples of like things that are being litigated or have been litigated right now with questions about whether or not this parody is fair use or like something is transformative enough. One case that I'm really interested in is Netflix suing Barlow and Bear, who are two musicians who wrote a musical based off of Bridgerton. Mm -hmm. And they did lift some lines of dialogue, but they wrote completely original music. They wrote some of the lyrics that weren't lifted from the show, but like it is about Bridgerton and it uses the names of characters and stuff like that. And Netflix sued them for copyright infringement and I don't think they've filed a countersuit yet, to my knowledge, but in theory, they would be likely to argue that 
they are not violating Netflix's copyright because what they did is so transformative. Mm -hmm. But as a legal expert here, since I am giving legal advice, I think that something like making a musical based off of IP that is completely different and creates something new out of the IP is probably more transformative than taking the Mario movie and putting Chris Martinet's lines well, instead so of Chris Pratt. Here's the interesting thing. Are you doing this as a parody or is it actually like just a replacement? Because I think in a scenario where you're replacing Chris Pratt with Chris Martinet and releasing this on Charles, Charles Martinet, Martinet. Yeah, and releasing this online, you are actually, this is actually market harm. It is not commercial, but it's like not not commercial, if that makes sense, where it's like this is the same product that's been released with a slight difference. And it is basically it falls into like it provides the same service almost as the original piece of media. And it is not actually that transformative. I would argue that this yeah. is actually not transformative because it's like, no, you've just replaced the lines. If I were like a good lawyer and if I was doing law stuff, it's 1 p.m. on Saturday. I would probably have some like actual like sites to give you. I don't. But I think what would be interesting here is that in the scenario where you're not replacing it with Charles Martinet, what you're replacing it with is random Charles Martinet Mario noises. That's a parody, I think. And then I think that actually becomes transformative. And in that case, I think there's like a decent argument that this is like a bit in the same way that like B movie, but every time they say B is yes. it's sped up is a parody. I was going to ask about that about like how come you can go on YouTube and find B movie but every time they say B it speeds up which is literally B movie well first of all like I mean the thing is that like there's not really a lot of incentive to sue people making memes in most cases unless the meme yeah. is so fucking like egregious that it's like there's a reason you want them to stop there's like not a ton of reasons why you'd want to send a season desist for a guy who puts B movie but every time they say B it's sped up because okay like it's clearly not for the original audience you can't actually like watch the thing this way it is a joke um in the scenario that you're putting yeah. up the mario movie but you've just replaced one of the actors well now somebody can actually watch the movie and by watching that movie they're not watching your movie so there's actual like market harm there and i also think like as you have said on previous episodes like to get sued somebody has to literally be sued mm -hmm. so maybe b movie but every time they say b it speeds up wouldn't hold up in court but if they're not being sued, then it doesn't matter whether it would hold up in court or not. I wrote about this like last year in the context of Shrek, but that that was a wild sentence. <laughs> but I think also in some cases you could argue that it is good for B-movie, that B-movie is a mm -hmm. meme. Yeah, because it, it's bringing like, awareness of, this is gonna sound weird, but the B-movie brand to the public. Like if, if something becomes a meme, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We talked about Morbius and how the meme about Morbius was do not see Morbius. But like in most cases, the meme is not do not see blank. Like the more people are going to end up seeing B movie because they're watching as a bit or something because they know it exists. But in this case, like this is also different because it's like, okay, so if you're watching Mario movie with Charles Martinet, you're not watching Mario movie as Chris Pratt, the official version. So in conclusion, it's probably, yeah, it's probably legal. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> However, if you do it for personal use, then you should hit yeah, us if, up. If you do this just for you, slide into our DMs. We do want to see it. What do you think are the other legal issues facing the Mario world? Mm, property damage within the Mario world. Because that man is just like destroying stuff and killing people. Murder. A lot of murder. Didn't Brian David Gilbert do a video about OSHA violations in Super Smash? Yes, and there were so many. Also, Isabel, I don't know this about you. Who is your Smash? Oh, main? I like don't play Smash. I but I, when I do, I play like Kirby. <laughs> okay, so my problem is that I want to be a Pikachu mm -hmm. main, but I am better with Young Link. That's devastating, dude. I know it's so sad. So when you're not being Mario's personal lawyer, you are a science fiction writer and something interesting happened to you this week. We're not even talking about the internet anymore. We're talking about Isabel went to a bar and got recognized. It was very weird. So fun fact for everyone who listens to this podcast, as if I have not brought this up five million times before, is that outside of like the law podcasting thing, I'm like actually like a science fiction writer. Like I was gonna say I'm just some guy, but I feel like I'm less of some guy now, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're like a few I'm guys. I'm like a few guys. Yeah, because so this is a cool thing that they do in New York like once a month where at this one bar, KGB bar, has like a fantastic fiction event, which is basically just readings by people who write science fiction and they have two like speakers every time and they're usually like somebody who is like at least moderately known in the industry, which is cool because it means that people like N.K. Jemison will like read their stuff there, stuff like that, and then you can like talk to them. Did we ever tell the story about when N.K. Jemison acknowledged our group N. K. chat? N.K. Jemison acknowledged our group chat, but I wasn't actually there and Nicole was there. <laughs> 
Well, we'll, we'll move, move on. on. No, one, no needs one needs to know. To know. So what happened is I went to this bar after work because I was like, okay, yeah, like Meg Allison is there and I like Meg Allison and I want to hear her read some stuff. And sometimes you need to do things by yourself and not bring your, all your friends with you. And also none of them are free. So I guess I'll just go alone. This is all the prelude to say that my plan to go to this bar was very much, I'm going to have one drink, sit at the bar, listen to some like wizard shit, maybe talk to people, but probably not because I think the social anxiety is going to get to me. And then I was so goddamn awkward at the bar that I did end up just talking to the person next to me because I was like, damn, sitting here in silence is not it. I'm really selling myself as someone who's good at talking to people, aren't I? And then we exchanged names like regular people do. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm Isabel. And he gets kind of like a funny look in his face. And he's like, wait, what's your last name? And so I tell him like my full <laughs> name. And he's like, wait, I read like a bunch of your stuff just recently. That's so cool. Like congrats uh, on the Shirley Jackson Award nomination. I was like, and I was uh, kind of like, what the fuck? I was not expecting to get That's recognized. So funny. Like I was like, yo, somebody knows my I'm like, I don't know who you are, you know who I am. What what is this? That's incredible. I don't I don't know if I've ever been recognized. Recognized? Yeah, that's like when when you get recognized for being a rock star, you get recognized. I see, I see. Although I've been with people who have been recognized mm-hmm. and I think it's very funny. It's like it's not bad, it's just it was weird and then like he was very cool about it and we had like a nice conversation and stuff, but I was just also kind of like, bro, what is happening? And also like, am I supposed to be cooler than I am? What's all this then? I don't know if I have anything funny to say about it other than, damn, I did get recognized in a bar. That was fucking weird. Yeah, I mean, nothing will be weirder than I think about this every night when I'm falling asleep. Just kidding, I don't. But at VidCon, when I realized that somebody from the circle was with me, yeah, and I was like, I just, I just realized who you are. <laughs> I f- did you think you weirded them out the way that I got weirded out? I don't know. Well, because like. Like, we were just, like, standing in line for something, and then fans kept coming up to this guy and being like, oh my god. And I was like, okay, let's be real. I don't know, like, 75% of the people Mm -hmm. that are, like, a big deal at VidCon. Like, I don't know. I've been wearing a sweatshirt from this uh, group called Crew District that was at VidCon that was, like, giving out sweatshirts. Mm -hmm. And they're, like five teens that do roblox videos together (laughs) okay but it's a nice sweatshirt but i'm like i don't know who these people are like there are so many like niche internet micro celebrities um if you will that you just don't know who everybody is so i was like oh yeah this this guy behind me is probably like tiktok famous or whatever and then i was like oh wait he's from the circle a show that i watch (laughs) And then I was like, oh, I just realized who you are. And he was like, yeah. But then his girlfriend was there and she was very, like, socially savvy. So she was just like, oh, uh, so who are you? Yeah. Like, and then she started, like, making conversation and was like, oh, like, um, you you were on a panel. How'd your panel go? And I was like, it went fine. And it was like a regular conversation. And, yeah. You know what? I feel like this what this yeah. conversation is really speaking to is, like, we've talked about this before where it's like you're – Nobody's famous to everyone anymore. You're famous to like 15 people. Anyway, okay, Amanda, what do you think I should say to people who recognize me in bars in the future? I think you should say, wow, that's so cool. I'm glad that you liked my stuff. But then you don't know if they liked your stuff. Because like in my situation, when I said to this guy, Brew from the circle, I was just like, I realized who you are. I didn't say whether I liked him or not, which I thought he was fine on the show. Like, he was pretty chill. He wasn't my favorite, but I didn't dislike him. Like, I think he did a good job I feel like that's what really what you should have told him. Like, yeah, you were all right on this. Like, really, like, you know, just deflate his ego. I mean, he got pretty far in the show, and he wasn't a huge asshole, and I think that's... pretty successful on reality Honestly, tv yeah i do think that's accurate anyway i don't know i guess i'm gonna go back to this bar again because like they do readings yeah, and stuff, i think you should I'm, now i'm now i'm gonna be yeah. really paranoid when i introduce myself to people because like i'm gonna be like hi i'm isabel and what if they say again what's your last name <laughs> no i'm dunking on this guy he was totally nice he was a very nice dude well did you know who he was absolutely not this was also Damn. the horrifying thing because i was like i spent the entire time being like do i need to know who you are because like it's also a bar and like his name was tim which is like that's a very regular human yeah. being name. And I'm also yeah. really bad about remembering people's names. And I'm like, oh, fuck, did I read anything about you? I don't think I had because I looked him up later. But it turns out that we n- know some people in common. Did you look up Tim from the bar? I did not bar? look up Tim from the bar. He DM'd me on Twitter. Oh, nice. So you got recognized. I got recognized. Now, if only people will recognize us for our podcast. I know, it's devastating that they don't. On- you know, actually, I think it's fine if they don't because the podcast is really just an auditory medium. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. 
But our charm. But our charm. Radiates. Our wit. Our joy to... Re- I can't pronounce that. Hey, speaking of literary drama on Twitter, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <sighs> okay, so this is something where I'm like, I don't even know why we're talking about it on the podcast. I think it's just occupied so much mental space in literary Twitter, and we love niche internet drama that I think maybe it's just worth, I don't know. So there is a literary magazine called Hobart. Mm-hmm. They are a very well respected magazine. They've always been volunteer editor. They don't pay anyone. It's just like they keep the website running, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think is stupid about the literary world is that it's like in poetry in particular, most of this is just people running websites and deciding whether or not you're good enough for their website. And like, then they don't pay you. You're just like begging somebody to put your stuff on their website for free. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like, why are we even doing this? But for me, that feeling escalated further when this week, a writer named Elizabeth Ellen, who is an editor at Hobart, published a 10,000 word interview with Alex Perez, who is also a writer. And I didn't know what was going on until I saw Hobart tweet something that said, this is why Hillary Clinton didn't get elected because y'all aren't ready for strong women in power or something like that. Okay. And I was just like, I don't know what the context is here. But then I saw like a ton of poets that I know were responding to the tweet, like, please remove your work from my- from your site. Wait, so who is Alex Perez? So Alex Perez is a Cuban-American writer mm-hmm. from Miami, and he went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is one of the most prestigious MFA programs, and he was talking in this interview in the beginning about how he felt very excluded from the Iowa MFA culture mm-hmm. because he is, like, some guy from Miami and he used to play baseball and he spent all of his life like growing up around sports and yeah so he was talking about how he felt isolated at Iowa and I was like okay I don't see how this is controversial and I was starting to be like oh my god I'm problematic Mm -hmm. because I was like I know that this interview really really upset people and I'm just reading it and I'm like okay he seems like kind of like annoying but he's not saying anything horrible Mm -hmm. and then he says that his favorite writers are like Hemingway and Bukowski and that he's a big believer in masculine writing and I'm like oh I see (laughs) the water is starting to heat up go on yeah and I'm just kind of still reading this and I'm like okay this is not great but this is not worth pulling your poetry from a website for sure and then you keep reading and just the more you read the worse it gets where does it go Eventually, this guy is talking about how feminism, like, ruined writing and how right now the climate in the literary world is most hostile to straight men. Oh my god, okay. Yeah, he just kind of complains about women and how feminism is horrible and he doesn't have a career because of feminism and everybody is a pussy. He said that over so and over again. So he was being he like was a whiny like, little piss baby. Yeah, and it's it's so long and, like... Like, it was a really weird experience reading this because at the beginning I was like, yeah, he has some points about Iowa. Like, everybody I know that went to Iowa that didn't like it ended up being successful because they were doing something that went against the grain. Mm -hmm. And Iowa just wants everybody to write the same poems. Fun fact... The Iowa Writers Workshop was actually part of a CIA operative to um, ramp down communism. Yeah, the style of Iowa is very much like the American literature with a capital A-L. And like a, we need to make this like stars and stripes, real wholesome shit. I'm describing this horribly, but like it's, it's like known that like the Iowa model, which was ported to basically every other writing workshop in existence is like a model that was vaguely CIA related. Anyway. No, you can Google this. This is right. I promise. This is not a conspiracy theory. We are not conspiracy. No, this is, there's actually been a lot of discourse about this, especially in the genre fiction space about like what models should workshops use going forward. Because one of the things that's happened in recent years is people have been talking about like Clarion West and stuff like that. And whether like these programs are like inclusive, are they like, is the like the Milford model, the Iowa model, is this like, like a cool and good model and is it like good for like you know people who are like outside the norm of like straight white dude because one of the arguments that people made sorry i'm just going on an info dump now i'm completely overriding you no this this is valid is that the iowa model was made for people who felt like they were already you know like how a straight white dude like feels like they're in charge and that they can say whatever they want 
and in that sort of situation yeah 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 i've i've been in writing workshops before yeah no exactly so what it's about is about like puncturing the ego of that sort of person because it's like okay so like the thing is like these are people who are not primed to take criticism we need to prime them to take criticism and like that's one of the arguments of like oh this is why i was structured this way however when you get people in a room who are not like straight white cis dudes does that assumption hold if you get somebody who is like not sure about their writing anyway or feels like an outsider maybe doing that to them actually just makes them stop writing anyway that's one of the arguments i actually had like a totally fine time in all my writing workshops but that's because i'm kind of an asshole anyway. <laughs> yeah i mean i think also we kind of fit in the pen literary establishment so to speak well hmm Hmm. Your boy writes science fiction, my man. (laughs) But then again, but in college, you like weren't writing science fiction. But again, this is the whole point is that you weren't writing science fiction in college because the advanced fiction professor was like, you have to write literary fiction. You know, I'm actually on his side about this, which I think is a controversial thing to say, considering that I'm a science fiction writer now. And he was very much like, your boy cannot submit science fiction to my class because (laughs) a lot of science fiction is very bad. And I get not wanting to read more of it. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I get it. Okay, first of all, like, I, we, we've totally got lost the plot, but, like, genre fiction is, I think, wrongly berated in society, but also being a nerd is, like, the thing to be now. And I don't know. For me, it was good to, like, write, like, about, like, not wizard things, because I think that it's important to take the wizard out of your writing and be able to write without the wizard, because then when you bring the wizard back, the wizard is more well-written. Anyway. <laughs> That's incredible writing advice. That's Dude, the, that's the contrary kidding. to the advice of, is your book boring? Put a wizard in it. Is your book boring? Take the wizard out of it and learn how to write and then put the wizard back in. Yo, I'm dead serious though, because No, okay. it's true. It's true. Yeah, because like, if you can't write without the wizard, then that means that your writing is a little bit boring and you need to figure out... Because the, the thing is like the tenets of how to make like something interesting or to like create plot and like character and like create like a forward thrust of motion in your narrative is the same regardless of whether it's genre fiction or if it's not genre fiction. And genre fiction, it's a lot easier to just like, there's a wizard here now, he's causing problems. But the real trick is like, if the wizard is not here, do they still have the same problems? And sometimes the wizard's problems are just emotional. And if you can write the wizard as just a guy who has emotional problems, you can write the wizard with the emotional problems. That's that's my writing advice corner for today. <laughs> I think that's great advice. Yeah, this also, this reminds me of a really good Twitter thread I saw. We're going to get back to the Hobart drama, but so Mm -hmm. we both are fans of the series, which it's called the Scholomance series by Naomi Novik, but the books are not called the Scholomance, like that's just the name of the series. And so there was somebody on Twitter who was like, everybody told me I had to read the Scholomance and it was so good. And these are people whose opinions I really hold in high regard. Hard. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And so he went on his Kindle and he downloaded the Scholomance. And he is very quickly like, this is a weird plot. This feels very misogynistic in a weird way, but it's written by a woman writer, right? So like, it's fine, whatever. Like he keeps going. (laughs) He's just like, yeah, I don't get it. Like this is from the perspective of this guy who is the only guy at the all female wizard school. And did he download the wrong thing? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) and the way he wrote this thread was very good because I was reading it being ready to be like, hey, fuck you for thinking this book is badly written. Naomi Novik is great. And then you're like, oh, the punchline is that he downloaded like a self-published book called Scholomance. Sorry, that's extremely funny. (laughs) And he like, and apparently he didn't realize it until halfway through he got to like a really, really like graphic and very kind of really horribly written sex scene. And then I think that was when he finally was like, hey, what the fuck? And then people were like, there's no graphic sex scenes in this. What are you talking about? That's super funny. Yeah. So that just reminded me of that, which I think is very funny. But (sighs) so back to the literary drama. So basically these writers kind of pulled the card of, oh, people are just mad because we're saying things that you're not allowed to say in the literary establishment anymore. We're saying what everybody knows, but because of censorship and like the wokeness, whatever, we can't say it. I guess I find it interesting because I think that whenever those arguments are made, it's very much like a dog whistle. Mm -hmm. It also kind of reminds me of another thing that NBC wrote about this week, which was, did you hear about how there was something going around about how in an elementary school, they had a litter box because of a kid who identified as a cat? Sorry, say what? There was a story going around about 
about a, an elementary school that had a litter box because a kid said that they identified as a cat. Okay, that didn't make any more sense the second time I heard it. Okay, you need to- what? <laughs> okay. This was going around, and this was being used by, like, Tucker Carlson as a way of being, mm -hmm. like, the liberals have gone too far, like, you let trans people identify as the gender that they want to identify as, and then look, mm -hmm. now kids are cats. And it was this kind of, like, transphobic, queerphobic dog whistle mm -hmm. that happens. Right. So NBC did an investigation where they were like, is this actually happening? Like, is there actually a school where there are kids that identify as cats? And like, if mm -hmm. so, why? What's going on there? So they investigate and they find out that there is an elementary school where they keep kitty litter stocked. However, the reason why they keep the kitty litter stocked is just in case they have an extended lockdown due to a gun threat. And if the kids need to go to the bathroom, they don't want them to just be like going on the floor. Shit, that actually makes perfect sense and it's depressing as hell. Yeah, so basically this transphobic dog whistle thing got investigated and it turns out that in reality it's just that gun violence is a huge fucking crisis in this country. I feel like this is like a metaphor for something. Yeah, I mean, I do think this kind of relates to the Hobart thing because I feel like this is constantly happening in internet discourse where everybody's like, ah, oh, like the woke liberal left and it's like a lot of moral panic about things that aren't really happening. Yeah, I feel like I have nothing funny to to say about it because it's true like this is the way that it works where it's like you know pull out like one thing that sounds fucked up and then it's like oh the, this thing that's actually fucked up is a totally different thing that is actually worse maybe the problem isn't queer people the problem is guns <laughs> yeah maybe the problem is that it's very easy to buy a gun in the united states of america and it should not be that easy yeah and maybe letting kids express themselves is normal and fine <laughs> now but if, but if kids express themselves and how would we control them a great point great point okay we're Damn. <laughs> now we're just getting depressing. No. <laughs> no. I mean, as somebody with lots of experience dealing with kids, I have no experience dealing with kids. I think that if the kids trust you and feel like you respect them, maybe they will behave better. Who knows? Anyway, kids are not peeing in litter boxes in schools. That's great news to hear, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is really critical. <laughs> yes. But um, but yeah, so to bring it back, like, it felt like this guy, Alex Perez, in this interview was getting very angry about the idea that, like, there's no place for him as a heterosexual writer. Mm -hmm. But, like, maybe his writing just wasn't good and that's why there's not a place for him. Yeah, maybe he just sucked. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, honestly, I feel like this is a very, like, really common... I feel like I'm gonna get canceled on Twitter for this, but I feel like this is a really common argument from... Like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a good way to, to, like, is it me who's out of touch? No, it's the kids who are wrong. You know, yeah. that one meme? Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that a lot of the quote unquote literary establishment is very much biased toward a certain kind of writing and especially a certain kind of story from marginalized people. Like people love the diaspora story. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, if you have a diaspora story, then cool. But then like I've worked with teen writers that are like, should I write about diaspora? And I'm like, I don't know, do you have something that you want to say about diaspora? And they're like, no, I think I should. That's my uh, moral panic of the day. That's super real though, because I think there's like, when I was starting writing, there was actually a really big fear that I had, which is that if I write about dias diaspora stuff, I'm going to get pinned as like, oh, the Asian girl who writes about diaspora stuff. Like, that was a genuine concern of mine when I was, like, starting to brand myself as a writer. Like, I keep a spreadsheet of how much Korean shit that I can write about before it becomes, like, too much Korean shit. And that's kind of a fucked up thing to have to do. Yeah. And it's not, like, necessarily something I have to do, but it's also kind of, like, I don't want to be the guy who everyone's like, oh, yeah, she writes about Korean stuff because that's actually just putting yourself in, like, a different sort of, like, genre ghetto. Yeah. But I also think that you should be allowed to write about Korean stuff if you want to. Yeah, I mean, like, I write about, like, a regular amount of Korean stuff which is the amount that I feel like writing about, but it's also like, I, you know, I keep track of how much of it is Korean stuff because I think there's a certain point at which like the general like white literary establishment will be like, yeah, that's a lot of Korean stuff. That's all you write about. And it's like, okay, <laughs> like, sorry that I'm Korean. Yeah. So basically where we are right now in this literary drama is that a bunch of the other editors resigned and now mm -hmm. this journal is just being run by Elizabeth Ellen, who published this interview where apparently she didn't get approval from the other editors to publish this interview. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense why they didn't get approval because the interview is literally just this guy being like, fuck feminists, we need more misogyny in the world. That's, what a spicy, what was he trying to do with this? You know, like it just... <sighs> 
Yeah, I don't know that this drama was just all over my feed this week. And I've just been thinking about it a lot. And then I've also been thinking about the kitty litter situation. And mm -hmm. I would rather just be thinking about Mario. Well, I mean, we did think about Mario for about like 20 minutes here. We could think about Mario more. <laughs> you know, thinking about Mario is free. You know, that's one of the rights that you have under the US Constitution is that you can think about Mario at any time you want. Yeah, you know, whenever you're getting stressed about the lack of gun control in the US, just think about Mario. Yeah, you know, he doesn't have a gun. Yeah. He's never seen a gun in his life. I mean, I guess he has because I guess in Smash, he's played against characters with guns. Yeah, but that's like alternate universe Mario. I don't yeah. consider that part of the canonical Mario experience. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is a good question. Is, is Super Smash Brothers canon? And on that note... <laughs> If you like this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons, and shout out specifically to Zoe, Bray, Andre, Thea, Brian, and Gabriel. If you want your name in the above or on our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wowtrue. Shout out to Allison Mills, beloved audio editor, and to graphic designer and Canva warlock Eric Silver, who made our logo, and Sam Reiser, who made our podcast music. You can find us on Twitter as at wowtruepod, and Instagram and Facebook as at wowtrue. Had your 15 seconds of internet fame? Are you famous to 15 people? Slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. Until next time, Let's get weird on the internet.